numbers of people who need help have increased. Uh, more and more people are in positions where they can't help themselves. They need the church to help. So we're looking. If you're interested and you have a passion for people, see Deacon Devon. And, uh, and, uh, and so sometimes I can't get to the hospitals. I can't get to every place at the same time. Sometimes I'm out somewhere and somebody else has to step in. Amen. And people get offended when I don't show up, when in fact I can't show up. So don't get offended. I'll send someone else in my place. That's why Jesus sent the disciples out to homes that he never visited because he couldn't get there. So he sent his disciples out to go and do the visitation for him. Somebody say amen to this. Amen. And so we, I can't always do uh, those kind of things, but it doesn't mean I don't care. It doesn't mean that uh, we're not still praying for God to intervene. Amen. Somebody say amen. Hallelujah. Man, hallelujah. Hallelujah. I've been telling you uh, in, in the weeks before today that the, 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 the shape of our ministry is, is going to be shifting and changing. And so I want you to see that this morning, what I'm doing. And I want our first speaker this morning to come up. It's going to be Andrew. And, uh, and then after Andrew is going to be his wife, Jessica. And then after Jessica is going to be the prophetess. Elisa, where's St. Lisa? She hiding? Oh, oh, it must have been the, the glow. Couldn't see you. Oh, my God. Anyway, here comes the brother. Good morning, everyone. Today's a good day, isn't it? You know, it's, the, it's the seventh day, which means that we made it through the week, and it's Sunday. It's the Lord's Day. And, you know, we just have to remember that. Each day is a blessing, and we're here to, to glorify him and to honor him. Amen. I want to turn to Genesis 30, 22, and 24. I'm a little nervous, so just bear with me. You can send some prayers my way. Genesis 30, 22. 22 to 24 says, Then God remembered Rachel, and God listened to her and opened her womb. And she conceived and bore a son and said, God has taken away my reproach. So she called his name Joseph and said, The Lord should add, shall add to me another son. The word Joseph in Hebrew means adding or letting him add. Joseph is a, is a dreamer. He had a lot of vision. And I want to go through again some scripture. I want to turn to Genesis 37, 1. Genesis 37, 1 says, well, one, <clears throat> now Jacob dwelt in the land where his father was a stranger, in the land of Canaan. This is the history of Jacob. Joseph, being 17 years old, was feeding the flock with his brothers. And the lad was with the sons of Billah and the sons of Zilpah, his father's wives. And Joseph brought a bad report of them to his father. Now Israel loved Joseph more than all his children because he was the son of his old age. Also, he made him a, a tunic of many colors. But when his brothers saw that their, their father loved him more than all his brothers, they hated him and could not speak peaceably to him. That's cold. That's cold. Your brothers hate you? Just think about that. I have two, I have two brothers. I, can, I can't even imagine if they hate me. How, how would I feel? Sheesh. Now Joseph had a dream, and he told, he told it to his brothers, and they hated him even more. So he shared his dream to his brothers, and because he shared his dream, this vision that he had, his brothers hated him more? How does that make sense, y'all? Yeah, it doesn't. It does not. So he said to them, please hear this dream which I have dreamed. There we were, binding sheaves in the field. Then behold... 
My sheaf arose and also stood upright, and indeed, your sheaf stood all around and bowed down to my sheaf. And his brother said to him, Shall you indeed reign over us, or shall you indeed have dominion over us? So they hated him even more for his dreams, for his words. Then he dreamed still another dream and told it to his brothers and said, Look, I have dreamed another dream. So he was having dream after dream and sharing these dreams and vision with his brothers. What is, this, what is this dream that you have dream? Shall your mother and I and your brothers indeed come to bow down to the earth before you? And his brothers envied him, but his father kept that matter in mind. So when Joseph's brothers, they went to his father's flock, to his, to his father's to, to, to feed the, to, to the flock. Let me take a breath. Woo. Take a step back. Joseph went looking for his brothers after his brothers left. And he was in the fields looking for his brothers, asking, you know, where, where are my brothers at? He didn't know. Then he ran to this to this man in the field and told him that they departed somewhere else. So then, of course, Joseph found his brothers. Now I want to read Genesis 37, 19 to 24. Then they said to, to one another, look, this dreamer is coming. Come, therefore, let us now kill him and cast him into some pit. And we shall say, some wild beast has devoured him. We shall see what will become of his dreams. But Reuben heard it, and he delivered him out of their hands and said, Let us not kill him. And Reuben said to him, Shed no blood, but cast him into this pit, which is the wilderness, and do not lay a hand on him, that he might deliver him out of their hands and bring him back to his father. So they were scared that Joseph was going to just return to his father. Genesis 31:35 says Let me slow down. So his brothers wanted to kill him. We all understand that. And they wanted to put him down in this pit. Genesis 37, 31 to 35 says, So they took Joseph's tunic, killed a kid of the goats, and dipped the tunic in the blood. Then they sent the tunic of many colors, and they brought it to their father and said, We have found this. Do you know whether it is your son's tunic or not? And he recognized it and said, It is my son's tunic. A wild beast has devoured him. Without doubt, Joseph is torn to pieces. Then Jacob tore his clothes, put sackcloth on his waist, and mourned for his son many days. Let's just think about that. Joseph was a dreamer. He was a, a young dreamer, a young dreamer and, and a person of vision. And all of us, including myself, we, I mean, we have a dream to, to achieve things in life and to go to the places that we may desire. However, I know for a fact, when I tried to do that without the Lord, I was going in circles. I was, I was going left and right and fighting myself. And I was, I was. I thought I could do it myself. You know, I thought I, was, I could do it myself, but I can't. Never could, and I never will. I never can do anything by myself. And in order for us to have these dreams, and in, 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 in our dreams may not even be aligned with God's goal for us, God's walk with us. It may not seem that way. It may, it may not be that way. We may want to be something, but God has another plan and said, oh, psych, you thought you were going that way? Nope. I have this for you. Amen? 
Joseph, he was a, he was a, a leader. He was a shepherd. And he, he has set examples that were like Christ Jesus. He came, he was another form of Jesus because of the examples that, that he left. And one thing, I'll, I'll, I think I'm going to start running in circles, so I just want to take a step back and close it with this and, and pass it on to Jessica, is that when life hits us as, as young people and we start to overthink and have anxiety and allow experience in our past come to our mind, in front of our mind, and, and blurs our vision, that's where we need to take a step back, seek God, set goals, set goals, have the right relationships. I lost, I, lost a, I lost a lot of friends since I came to the Lord. I only have one friend. That's it. I only have one friend. It's true. And you can ask my wife. I was a popular guy, you know, had a lot of friends. But, hey, God, God removes the people from your life that do not add to you and that can distract you and that can pull you and, and that can stir you the wrong way and can steer you the wrong way and can, you know, and, and that's why it's, it's, it's so important that these right relationships, again, I'm going to the young adults, let's get together, let's, let's do this thing, let's do this thing because I, I believe that this body, the whole body, and this specific church is, is amazing and I feel that we've been getting to know each other a little bit more and again, we all need to come together under one accord. Let Jesus move. Allow us to encourage each other. When we have a hard time, let's not be scared to say, hey, man, like I'm having a hard time. Say, what is it? What's, what's going on? And the, and the thing with, with, with God is that he gives us favor, and he'll open doors for us. I can have, you know, five doors here, but, you know, if I'm unwilling to, to walk into that door, I'm going to be stuck right here, you know? I'm going to be stuck right here and not, and not move. So I need to be willing to get up, obey, obey my father, do my part, and walk into this door that he opened. Amen? Amen? I'm going to close with that, and I want to invite my beautiful wife, Jessica, up here. I know he'll not be very happy about me saying this, but I was kind of laughing because we were studying together this morning and had a plan of what we were going to say, and he definitely got off track from the plan that we, we had. But, um, <laughs> uh, you know, it, he was speaking from his spirit, so I appreciate that. Um, I'm Jessica. I'm sure all of you know me, but I um, just want to introduce myself. Um, recently, I learned that the Holy Spirit is supposed to be my best friend, so I'm just praying that the Holy Spirit will be here for moral support and uh, <laughs> um, to help me to understand this teaching in a way that I would be able to uh, teach you guys in some way. Um, so everyone continue to have Joseph in mind. Um, what Andrew, what we talked about was that how Joseph um, can be compared to Jesus. You know, he was um, a shepherd for one, and he can be compared to Jesus. Uh, <laughs> um, but in when Andrew is reading um, Genesis chapter thirty-seven, um, it shows that um, Jacob, sorry, Joseph, was. Um, Dreaming concerning rulership. In verse 8, reading again, it just says, His brother said to him, Shall you indeed reign over us, or shall you indeed have dominion over us? So they hated him even more for his dreams and for his words. 
So why is rulership or being a leader in this world important in terms of living for the kingdom? Well, it's because God... This is one that we've probably all heard at some point, but Matthew 5, 14 says, You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Um, when, I re when I read verse 15 where it says, Nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on the lampstand, I just thought to myself, like, of course, we wouldn't, you know, turn on a light and then cover it with a blanket, right? Um, I believe that this means that God is putting us into um, positions where someone else is watching us um, and where he's wanting us to lead by example. Um, the book of Philippians um, also calls us light bearers. So in Philippians chapter 2, if you would turn there, Verse 14 reads, Do all things without complaining and disputing, that you may become blameless and harmless, children of God without fault in the midst of crooked and perverse generation, among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding fast the word of life, so that I may rejoice in the day of Christ that I have not run in vain or labored in vain. So let's go back to some of the qualities of Joseph. Um, we're going to turn back to the book of Genesis chapter 39. Sorry to bring you everywhere. So he was a, Joseph was a slave now in chapter 39. And uh, verse 2 reads, The Lord was with Joseph, and he was a successful man. And he was in the house of of his master the Egyptian and his master saw that the Lord was with him and that the Lord made all he did to prosper in his hand so Joseph found favor in his sight and served him then he made him overseer of his house and all that he had put under his authority I'm going to continue Chapter 7 continues and says, And it came to pass after these things that his master's wife cast long, longing eyes on Joseph, and she said, Lie with me. But he refused and said to his master's wife, Look, my master does not know what, it, what is with me in the house, and he has committed all that he has to my hand. There is no one greater in this house than I, nor has he kept back anything from me but you, because you are his wife. How then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? So it was, as she spoke to Joseph day by day, that he did not heed her to lie with her or to be with her. So now we know that Joseph is an example like Jesus was and that he has qualities that we should replicate to um, be more like Jesus and Joseph. So we see there that he refused the wife. And, and remember, like Andrew said, he was young. He was 17. So I'm sure it was very hard for this 17-year-old boy to refuse this woman who was basically throwing herself at him. Um, but we see that the first quality that we should replicate is um, not giving in to, you know, sexual immorality which Joseph didn't do. Um, so, sorry, I'm getting like even more nervous speaking to you guys. But that's his first quality. So it goes on to say that, you know, she's upset because she got refused and she basically lies and says, well, he hit on me. Um, so Genesis 39, 20 reads... Then Joseph's master took him and put him into the prison, a place where the king's prison, prisoners were confined, and he was there in the prison. But the Lord was with Joseph and showed him mercy, and he gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. And the keeper of the prison committed 
to Joseph's hand all the prisoners who were in the prison. Whatever they did there, it was his doing. The keeper of the prison did not take did not look into anything that was under Joseph's authority because the Lord was with him and whatever he did, the Lord made it prosper. So we saw the second quality. Joseph was an overcomer. He was in prison, but everything, everyone was under him and, and he was still showing his dominion over everything, even where he was in his circumstance. So second quality, he's an overcomer. Um, and because of these qualities, um, chapter 41 in Genesis, which I won't read to you, but if you were to read it on your own, shows that um, Joseph actually dreamt of the answer that would save the entire nation after that. Um, so in closing, this is why it's important to recognize these qualities that we're seeing in this instruction book that we have called the Bible. Um, and replicate those things. And that's it. <laughs> Here you go, Alicia. Okay. Well, you guys know the story. Um, um, and I believe that it's so vital that God... Um, is bringing us in in what he's called us to do. He says in um, in um, in Genesis forty one thirty eight that that uh, Joseph was full of the Holy Spirit and he was recognized. And I think that is so important for us to recognize that we have an identity. The world will tell us what who we are. But if we don't know who we are in Christ, see, Joseph knew something. So even when his brothers came against him, what did he say? Nothing. He just said, I had a dream. And that is so key about us, is that people will come against you. They will tell you, you are this, you are that. But the body of Christ needs to stand up because there are oracles that are in your mouth that can set a generation free. And God is looking for us to be low and meek so that we can change this generation. And I, I just believe that that's one thing that it is a shadow and type. Joseph is a shadow and type of who Christ is. And I think that's it's a beautiful thing because you look at Jesus when he came here. Did he ever say anything of himself? No, he just he he walked in what God said. They spit on him. He did not respond. They beat him. He didn't respond. And what should we do as a body? We are the body who are supposed to be the light of the world. We are supposed to walk in the likeness of who Christ called us to be. It is so key for us to walk in that fullness. Because when we start walking in that fullness, then we're walking as Christ walk. We don't respond in our natural state. So, um, and I, what I was, it was really funny, is that um, Joseph's son's name was that, um, his name was um, uh, Manasseh, and it, it says it causes him to forget. So he knew all that was behind him. He said, all this, God caused me to forget that. Yeah. What a beautiful thing that is. That he could have, he trusted the Lord. He didn't waver. He said, I'm going to trust the Lord. I know he's my redeemer. I know who I am in Christ. He didn't waver at that. And that's our job and our position in the body of Christ is that we need to know who Christ is inside of us. Because if we don't, then this world will tell us. He'll tell us that you need to be like the people in this world. We need to be the people who are, who will hug those people who are dying. There's people who are committing suicide. There are people who are dying in this world. We need to stand up. We need to say, no, God I'm going to be your child I'm going to be your servant I'm going to be the light of this world and um the three things that Joseph really did he he was a um he preserved right he 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 put the food he took the food and he preserved it God gave him a vision so he preserved what God had called him to do and and he was acting it out and and it said that we are the salt of the earth and if you're not the salt it will lose its taste right I love some steak so, right? We, we need to have that. We need to taste. We need to taste good. Our nature needs to taste good. It needs to look like Christ. If Christ is the root, he, a root of an, or, uh, he's a seed of an apple, that apple is going to taste good and it's going to be crispy. So we need to be like the God's nature. We need to have our, his nature. 
And, and you know how you get his nature? By studying his word. Because you can never overcome anything in this life without the word of God. The word of God says that if you diligently seek me, you shall find me. So what does that mean? Seek me out. Seek me out and find what I am about. Yes. And, the, and another thing he says, he, he, fed, he fed the people. You know, when we become the oracle of Christ, we're going to feed this nation. We're going to feed Silicon Valley. We're going to feed them with the word of God that says they will live and not die. That is the identity. That is who we are. People don't know who they are, but we do. Because why? Because Christ lives inside of us. He said, greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. And then he delivered others. What? He delivered others? God used him to deliver his own brothers and, and, and father. And they were like, you? I mean, yeah, me, little old me. I, deli- I, I was the one, I was a vessel. And when people lied on him, like there's people who lie in the church. And they'll lie on you. And they'll tell you things. But you say, what? Lord, I, 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 I get on my feet for them. Because that's when you have a vision. You have a vision from the Lord. You see people as God called you to see them. They are, your, your, you're responsible for them. Because you're supposed to lay down your life for your friends. You're supposed to lay down for them. And your brothers and sisters, that's what God calls us to do, to lay our lives down so we have a vision for this, this body. That's how unity comes in. When I could say, I don't see her sin no more. I don't see his sin no more. I see what God sees. He's a finished product. Um, and, um, but through all the tribulations and trials, um, the Holy Spirit reminded me that he, kept, he told me last year, Hebrews 11, 1, and I was like, I don't know what you're talking about. I can see clearly. No, I can't see clearly. I can't. And every day I think I see clearly, it, it's just, it's, 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 you got to submit to the Holy Spirit. And, and that's, what, that's exactly what Joseph did. He submitted to the Lord. He asked the Lord what he needed to do. And he, re, and he repeated. And, the God, and, and Pharaoh said, is there a man who, has a, who has, knows God? Do we know God? As a body, do we know God? Do we know the intimacy, what it is like to, d- to dwell in his presence, the fullness of who Christ is? That is so key to, this bo- to the walk of who God called us to be, is that people recognize, they'll say, there's something different about you. I didn't want to read all what we already read because we all um, had it, but there is a scripture in Deuteronomy that I thought was so beautiful. Um, it's in... Um, Deuteronomy, sorry, my phone's a little slow, um, sorry, um, okay, it talks about how precious we are, and it was talking about how Joseph was precious in the Lord's eye, and and, and that's how God sees us, he, he sees us as precious children of God, okay, here I got it. Um, it's in Deuteronomy 33:13. It says, "Let me get the full chapter." Um, and jo- and of Joseph, he said, "Blessed by the Lord be His land with precious things of heaven and with dew, and from the deep water that lies beneath, with precious fruits of the sun, and with the precious uh, produce of the month." Of the months, and I'm gonna skip down to the verse 16. It says, "With precious things of the earth, its fullness and favor, a good goodwill of him who dwelt in the bush. Let these things come upon Joseph's head and upon the crown of the head of him who distinguished as a prince among his brothers." How beautiful is that? That God said He gave the fullness of of God inside of us. Didn't he say that in scripture? He said, I gave you the fullness, the fullness of joy. Uh, there's fullness of God, who God is inside of you. And um, he said, um, uh, what is the scripture? It's, um, let me think. Sorry, let me slow down. Okay, a crown of life. In Revelations, it speaks of that, that we would receive a crown of life. And I think that is so key that when we do what God called us to do, we receive that crown of righteousness. And and there was a, um, there's a gate called Gade. And I, I, was, I was reading um, in the scripture that Gate was a place of victory. And that was one place Joseph had to go. And, and oh, that, was, that was the scripture, Lord. Um, it talked about how Joseph was a whale. 
And he had a, they dug a well, and Joseph was a well for others to come and come out of. That's what he gave. He gave them food, right? He, that's what we as a body of Christ are. We are, to do, we are supposed to be able to, we're living water, right? The living water flows through us. That's what we are. So people who don't know Christ will come to us saying, do you know how I can get saved? Do you know how I could talk on to, about the Lord? Who, who can set me free from drugs and alcohol? Who could set me free? That as young people... We need that. That's what this world needs. They need, this says a manifestation. The world is waiting for the manifestation of sons. You are the sons of Christ. You have sonship. You have rulership here on earth. So you need to, you need to walk in that, right? I'm excited because if I walk in that, that means that my brother will be set free from meth, right? My dad will be set free from meth. People in my family will be set from alcohol. People in my life, I will be set free. My son will be set free. My nephew will be set free. The people I know will be set free. They will not be tormented by the enemy. He has called us victory. He said, we are the victory. We are the victories of his son. We are the well. Fill up your well with the word of God. Come on, give the Lord a praise this morning. Come on, this is our younger generation. We're preparing them. We got to give them room. Amen. See what they got inside of them. Amen. I thought each one of them did well. Amen. I... Really well. And I didn't give them a long time to prepare. Isn't that true? I wasn't talking to you. <laughs> you're supposed to be instant ready. I'm not going to give you no month and you talk to Jesus every day and you study every day. You ought to have a word every, every time you wake up in the morning. You ought to have something to talk about. You don't have to give me a week. You can tell me, you can tell me in five minutes have a message. I'll have it. Because I live in the word. Come on, body of Christ. I live in this thing. You don't need a commercial. Come on, body of Christ. Well, I'm just so proud of each one of you, boy. I'm so really. What I, what I noticed about Jessica, she's the teacher. What I noticed about Andrew, and he's getting this stuff ready, he's going to be a preacher. He's going to be preaching under a great anointing. And Je Jessica is a detailer. She brought detail. And uh, uh, Elisa is a, what I would call, uh, an exhorter with an evangelistic anointing on her. Amen. She's an exhorter. She's exhorting. And what, what, what our young people need, they need somebody to exhort them. To exhort, hey, look, there's other choices you can make besides the ones that you have before you. Come on. You know, the world is going to hell. Please believe me. You think this ugly, nasty, abortion baby, killing people world, is going somewhere positive, you better wake up. You better wake up. And just like you were born, one day you're going to die. What you going to do then? And you haven't made the right decisions where you live. I tell people uh, uh, that I don't usually ask people how they die. I asked you how you lived in between that time. How did you live your life? Did you waste it or did you live it? There's a difference between living your life and wasting your life. Come on here, somebody. Amen. I wasted many years of my life in and out of prison, jail, drugs, ODing. Come on, falling out, passing out. Can't find my car. I'm not hearing nobody say amen to this stuff. It's a shame when you can't even find your own car. Somebody say amen. Walking around there in the Coliseum for four hours, my car parked on the other side. Got the police looking, everybody, the car is parked on the other side. Now, you know, that's crazy. It's the only one in the parking lot. God is good. 
I'm really proud of you. I really, really am. Thank you so much for And I mean, I asked them, uh, and they said, yes, of course. No, uh, you know, drawing back. Hey, listen, if the apostle is asking you to do something, that means he thinks you're ready to do it. There's always a beginning of someone's journey. And I just asked it to be under the watchful eye of the elders. We watch you grow up and don't get ahead of us. Don't start telling us who you are. Let us decl declare. You can't self-appraise yourself. You do not know if you're ready or not. You just don't. All the trees in my backyard don't tell me when they're ready. I prune them when I decide to prune them. I'm not getting any amens on this stuff. The gardener comes back there every year, and he tells me I'm going to prune your trees, and he prunes the trees. The trees don't say, hey, I, I think I need some pruning over here on the left and some on the right. No, you don't get to do that. Somebody else does that for you. Then one day you do it, just like your children. Your children are going to say, Mommy, they, they, got the, they don't have nothing but their underwear on, so I'm getting ready to go out to go to school. You said, you ain't leaving the house dressed like that. But, Mommy, this is what I want to wear. You're not gonna let them, we're not going to let you go out here and face this devil out here and you're not dressed right. You got to have your armor on and everything there. I want to talk to you. Bello came. Prophet Bella from Sweden came three, two or three years ago, and he taught a message on the, the, the uh, shaking and the shifting and the sifting of the Lord. Well, uh, the Lord spoke to me. I was reading a book by, Bell, uh, by Kelly Varner, and, uh, and the scripture came out of 1 Corinthians chapter 10, jumped off the page at me, just jumped, and I said, wow. I read this and read this, but it seems like I need to go back and look at it again. And then I remembered what a prophet Bellow said about the sifting. I seen the shaking and I seen the shifting, but now I, I see the Lord ready to sift us, say sift us. But because the people of God could not go into the promised land until they had been sifted, say they couldn't go in into the promise without the sifting. Now I want to define to you for a moment what the sifting represents. There were some things that happened to the people while they were in bondage. You know, some things happened to me in my childhood I never told anybody about. In my life, I thought nobody could ever, I couldn't tell anybody some things. Uh, uh, and there's some things that God allowed to happen to me that uh, caused some things, scar tissue in my inside, scar tissue, come on in my soulish realm. Memories that bring, there's even today when I think about certain people, I get mad. Don't get, I'm trying to be right with them. I'm trying to let you see. Because it bring up a time where they just betrayed or stabbed me or hurt me. And I, I have forgiven them, but I still got some scar tissue. That's all I'm saying. I, I, I've been cut uh, five different times in my spine. And, uh, uh, the, the guy says, well, I'm not going to do major surgery. I'm going to do just a little bit of microsurgery. But when I came out the surgery, I noticed that this felt different than all the other microsurgeries. He says, well, when I got in there to do the surgery, you have so much scar tissue that I couldn't do microsurgery. He said, because of the scar tissue from all the other surgeries. So because of the things that happen in our lives, sometimes there's layers of scar tissue. Amen. And, and, it, and, and just the mention of a situation brings it up in your, in your soulless realm. And your emotions get tied up in it for a minute until you say, no, no, I'm not going that way. So what the Lord did, because the people he knew they had been in bondage for 400 years. Now, listen to this, 40 generations in servitude to Egyptian. Now, you know, they talk like the Egyptians. Come on, somebody. They worship the Egyptians' gods. They ate the Egyptian food. Come on, body of Christ. They did the Egyptian dances. Are you hearing what I'm saying? They, they listened to Egyptian music, and they forgot about the God that, that they used to serve. It's almost a picture of the church today. You got the same music, got the same, everything in the church. It's just like in Egypt. In the world. Egypt is a type of the world. Stay with me. Don't lose me here. I have to show you something. 
So God had to bring them out of that bondage to get them separated from Egypt so he could work out what 400 years of bondage had done to their character, to their soulish realm. It had destroyed some things in them. Integrity, it, it, it destroyed their loyalty. It destroyed uh, them. And so he had to come and bring them into a place where he could do some sifting to get some things dealt with before they could go to the promise. See, some of us are trying to get to the promise. We, we say all the right words, but some stuff inside of us needs to be sifted. Oh, yeah, we know how to play church. We know how to, we know how to fake praise and fake worship because we don't do it at home. One time we do it is on Sunday. That means you're faking. This is a seven-day-a-week journey here. You got to praise him every day of your life. Every day of the week, he must be Lord of your life. He must be the God of all glory. You know, better stop preaching up in here, Elisa. I don't know what's wrong with you. Got me excited. I'm a blame sifting. Golden Arthur Ministries is being sifted. I'm going to show you what he's sifting us from. Are you ready? I'm in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 5 through 10. Father God, I ask for clarity, understanding, accuracy. I ask that every eye be open with spiritual wisdom, revelation, and the knowledge of God be received in Jesus' name. Amen. Now watch this. But with many of them, God was not well pleased. Matter of fact, I'm going to read it to you from the Amplified. Are you ready? Never, nevertheless, God was not pleased with a great majority of them, for they were overthrown and shrewn down along the ground in the wilderness. Now, these things are examples and warnings and admonitions for us not to desire or crave or covet or lust after evil and carnal things as they did says, do not be worshipers of false gods as some of them were. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink the sacrifice offered to the golden calf of Horab and rose up to sport and to dance and to give way to jesting and hilarity. We must not gratify evil desires and indulge in immorality as some did, and 23,000 of them suddenly fell dead in a single day. We should not tempt the Lord and try his patience uh, to uh, become a trial to him, critically appraise him, exploit his goodness as some of them did, and were killed by poisonous serpents, nor discontently complain as some of them did and were not and were put out of the way entirely by the destroyer. All these things befell them by the way as a figure, as an example and warning to us. They are written for to admonish and to fit us for right action in, uh, by good instruction. We in whose days and ages have reached their climax, their consummation and concluding period. That therefore let everyone who thinks he stands, who feels sure that he has a steadfast mind and standing firm, take heed lest he fall in the sin. And if you kept on reading, it would say uh, there is a temptation that's common under man. And, and, and all of us are not tempted by the same things, but one thing is common to man. Satan's only temptation to you that makes a difference is for you to find fault in God's word. It's for you to look somewhere else other than what the word of God says. Come on. And, and what the devil is really shrewd. He'll tell the black people, oh, that's the white man's Bible. He'll go to the next one and say, oh, that, they changed that Bible. And every generation that he wants to deceive you, he wants to get you away from the Bible. Come on, you hear it? And so you can find something wrong with it. Are you hearing what I'm telling you? The only thing wrong with the Bible, you're not taking time to learn it. Because it's not for the natural man. The Bible says the carnal man or natural man cannot understand spiritual things. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. They're only spiritually discerned. 
So you can't read the Bible with your mind. You have to read it with your spirit. That's why Andrew kept saying, let me step back and engage my spirit, man, because I'm struggling up here in my natural, man, because I want to give a good display. Of, of, Apostle Kyle trusted me to come up here, and I want to do a good job. So let me step back out of where I'm nervous and get, regain my composure in the spirit. That's what he was doing. Do you understand that? Because the natural man cannot fulfill a spiritual mandate or requirement. Only your born again man. And my kids were born of their mother. This is how my kids came into the earth legally. She's the legal door for my children's entrance into the world. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Now, there's another way to come into the kingdom. You must be born again and come into the door of the church to be legal in the kingdom of God. You, there's no way to be legal unless you're born again. And my tears on Friday were based on this fact. I, re I researched and found out that a great majority of people are in the church today that are not saved. And they're in this false thing. They think they're saved because they shook the preacher's hand. They think they're saved because they went to their mom and daddy's church. They think they're saved because they do some ceremonial thing. They think they're saved because they do something religiously every day. But they don't know their salvation. They don't know Jesus. They have not been born again. And you can't come into the kingdom unless you've been born again. And the funny thing about it, it's the easiest thing for anyone to do. Just say Jesus. I like the Bible says, it says, say, save me and thou shalt be saved. <laughs> That's what it says. Save me, Lord, and I shall be saved. He didn't say you have to do all this sinner's prayer. and all. He said you have to believe in your heart. He said, save me, Jesus. And he said he'll save you. Not us religious people. Well, I think they need to do a little bit more than that to get saved. Rotten sinners. You at least need to make them do a five-minute prayer to get in. It's never enough for the people of God. They always want somebody to do something else. That's religion. No, he said, call on my name and thou shalt be saved. Call on me while I'm near. Call on me while I'm available to be called on. If you return to me, I'll return to you. That's what he's talking about. He's not talking about you saying a sinner's prayer. Of course, I said one. That's what they told me to do. They said, say this. I said, okay. They told me to be a parrot. Say this. Give me a cracker. Quack, 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 quack. That little parrot ministry was on me. But then while I sought God, I met him, and I got born again. I got born again for real. I wept for six months. I guess my family thought I was having a nervous breakdown, but I was so glad to be saved. I was so glad that I was going to have a chance to lead my children into righteousness. I was so glad because I wasn't a good dad before then. I, th I, was, a, I was a crazy person. I say crazy. Does that need an explanation with crazy me? All right, let me move on here. Now watch this. So the first deadly sin that needed to be sifted out of the people was murmuring. Murmuring means to complain and to grunt and groan about every little thing in your life, everything that's said in the church. If you please the Lord and the Lord heard it and his anger was kindled and the fire of the Lord burnt among them and consumed them that were in the uttermost parts of the camp. Listen carefully. The complaining didn't come from the middle of the camp. It came from the uttermost parts of the camp where the least commitment to the church was in the people. The ones who gave the least offerings, the ones that came to the least amount of meetings, were the ones doing all the complaining, and somehow they contaminated the faithful. So now all of them were complaining, and God got angry. There's always somebody standing back thinking they know what's best for everything. So on the outside, my pastor told me when the people were complaining about me, because I was praying so loud over at the church. They said, that brother's praying so loud, and the building walls were this thick. I said, how did they hear me outside? It was the Holy Ghost convicting them. 
Amen. And they told pastor, the pastor called me to his office. He said, hey, I'm getting a lot of complaints. I said, what you want me to do about it? He said, you don't do nothing. He said, if they're not in the boat with you, don't pay attention to them. But if they have an oar, that, that means they're with you. If they stand outside running their mouth, just go on by them. If they're not in the boat, they're not with you. They shouldn't have any uh, uh, influence on you whatsoever. They're not helping you do nothing. They're just talking. You hear what a lot of people just talking. They don't do nothing to help us go forward. We're always looking at somebody's ear to talk into. The Bible said, be careful what you hear. Now watch this. And Moses cried, and the people cried to Moses, complaining, and Moses prayed to, unto the Lord. The fire was quenched, and he called the name of that place Terebrith. Because the fire of the Lord burnt among them. They were complaining. God said, I have to sift out your complaining and moaning, trying to make the world perfect when you're not. Spirit is on you. How can you have a perfect world when you're still in it? Okay, I'm ducking because I see stuff. Can I go a little bit further? Always mumbling. Oh, dear. You remember, what was the guy, uh, the little rascals, the one with the deep voice? Froggy? That's, you know. Then they had a guy on Dick Tracy. Remember him? His name was Mumbles. You don't remember that? Dick Tracy would ask him a question. He would say, he said, thank you, man. Thank you. Somehow he could interpret his mumbling. Some of you are not as old as I thought you were. The next thing that he had to sift out of the people was carnality. So mumbling, now carnality is, he said, in a mixed multitude was among them and fell a lusting, and the children of Israel also wept again and said, uh, who shall give us flesh to eat? When are we going to have some more programs? When you going to bring in the power team? When you going to bring somebody in to entertain us? When we going to be able to eat some flesh? We remember the fish that we did eat in Egypt and the cucumbers and the melons and the leeks and the onions and the garlic. And now our soul is dried away because we don't have no Egyptian food. We can't bump and grind like we used to. And our soul is dried up because I can't wear that tight dress that shows my figure anymore. And I can't let my bust be out anymore. And my soul's dried up because that's how I got men to come into my life. When they saw my flesh, they wanted me. Now nobody wants me because I got my flesh all covered up. Oh, give us some flesh. And they were weeping. Now our soul is dried away. There is nothing at all besides this old dirty man or this word of God is all we have to eat. And that alone shall we eat, live by. I'm so tired of the word. So he had to sift that desire to live out your old life through this new man. Rather than allow your new man to live out his life while you put off the deeds of your former life. So you can come into abundant life and the life that he came to give you, kingdom life. I got to move on quickly. Now, this third sifting was very critical. I want you to get this. Numbers 12, 1, and Miriam and Aaron spake against Moses because of the Ethiopian woman he had married, for he had married an Ethiopian woman. Now, Ethiopian woman was a black woman. Miriam and her brother got mad because Aaron brought in a black woman into their family. Watch this. And they rose up against Moses and said, what you doing with this, this Ethiopian? Watch this. I didn't, I'm not hearing nobody say anything. What happened was, 
The Lord heard her. Say, the Lord what? See, when you're talking, the Lord's hearing you. When you're running your mouth, the Lord is listening to what you're saying. And the next day, she broke out with leprosy. Isn't it interesting? And she turned pure white. Aaron's, uh, Moses' wife was black, and now here she is pure white. Come on, somebody here. God got a sense of humor, doesn't he? <laughs> I just want you to see this. But see, and the camp could not go forward as long as she was sick with leprosy and prejudice. The camp did not move until she was healed. Ladies and gentlemen, until you get rid of that racist spirit, that sexist spirit that you have on you, and that look at people different, respect their person spirit, this church can't go nowhere until God sifts that out of you. To everybody is a child of God, no matter what color they are. Everybody's a child of God, no matter what they look like. Everybody's a child of God. So God had to sift it. He couldn't give them the promise as long as they wanted something from the flesh. And now they were making a differentiation of the color. And God did not uh, punish Miriam because she was just a woman. It's because she got out of position with God's decision. Some of you need to hear what I'm saying. I got to tell you this because I have a fear on me that you're not listening to what I'm telling you. You cannot be what you want to be in the kingdom of God. You already decided what you're going to be. Now, this first case of rebellion only the individuals were dealt with, Aaron and Miriam. The cool thing about that, Miriam was called to the same office as Moses and, and Aaron. They, they, were, uh, the, they were given responsibility for 3 million people. 3 million people they had responsibility over, and she got time to be worried about what color Moses' wife is at. Some of y'all ever hear what I'm saying. You, you got, you're so busy telling everybody what their wife ought to look like, you ain't taking care of your wife. I better go over here. You better take care of your own home. What's your wife telling her girlfriends about you? I better sing it. What a friend. We have in Jesus, we can take him at his word. Now let's talk about rebellion and the second stage of rebellion where it affects a whole nation. Listen carefully. Number 16, 1 through 3, it says, Now Korah, the son of Issar, the son of Kohath, the son of Levi, and Dathan, and Abram, the sons of Eliab, on, uh, and on the son of Peleth, sons of Reuben, took men, and they rose up before Moses with certain of the children of Israel, 250 princes of the assembly, famous in the congregation, men of renown. And they gathered themselves against Moses and against Aaron and said to them, You take too much upon you, seeing all the congregation are holy, every one of them, and the Lord is among them, therefore then you lift yourselves up before the car. In other words, we don't, we don't agree that God chose you to lead all th three men of these people, and we're just as valuable as you are. So we believe that we, you ought to allow some of our family to be in the priesthood as well. And they were in the priesthood. They were Levitical priests. They got to carry the Ark of the Covenant and the table of showbread and, 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 and the candlestick and they, got, they carried that through the wilderness, but they wanted a greater responsibility than the one that God gave them. And some of you don't, you better hear me. You cannot have a greater responsibility than the one God gives you. And some people think it's in my court to decide. It's not. My, my position is to listen to what God is saying to me. I had a young lady come to me. She said, well, I, I, uh, the Lord spoke to me that you should ordain me. I said, well, then we need to do only one thing we need to do. He said, what? Wait till he tell me. Because if he don't tell me, it's not going to happen. She's, and, and she got offended at me. 
because I didn't hear her God tell me what he told her. She made her own God like many people do. They have their own Holy Spirit. He talks to them and says things that are apart from the headship of the church, which is impossible. I didn't say he didn't speak to you, but he doesn't speak to you about the headship of the church. That's not your responsibility. It's quiet here in River City. I got to move quickly. I can't. So, so, so now it's 25 princes that raise up at least 14, 15,000 other people to rebel against the leadership of the house. I had it happen here where people said stuff and people did their thing and they rose up and, and never even called me to see if it was true that was what, what was being said. They just went with somebody who was popular. I'm not mad at nobody because my father spanks the butt around here. I don't get to spank. That's father's business. I'm here, I don't do that. I'm not the kind of pastor talking about. I know some people have been in churches where you left. Pastor, if you leave, you leave with the curse of Ham upon you and your generations and your, and your dog going to have fleas and all kind of stuff. Somebody tell me not, that's, that's not the truth. Amen. But that's not how it works. And so these 250 were killed by the Lord. Then because the, the, because the company of people with them didn't repent, God had to swallow them up as well. So now we got 14,850 people. Have the, the ground opens up and swallows them up because they were rebellious and, uh, before the Lord. And God took the princes' censors that they, that they had, and they smashed them down, and they nailed them to the brazen altar, brass censors, amen, as a memorial against rebelling against God's decisions. Now, remember, this was written for your admonition so you don't make the same mistakes. Final one, unbelief. This is the most terrible one. This cost uh, nearly 3 million people to die in the wilderness without ever receiving the promise because of this unbelief. Unbelief is the most, there's nobody going to hell for being a whore, a robber. Nobody's going to hell because of, of, of that. They're going to go to hell because they rejected Jesus Christ. That's the only way you can go to hell, to reject the, the, the offer of salvation is to reject heaven. And nobody lives, you see, if somebody says, well, hi, the church is so mean, you telling people they're going to go to hell, and you're telling, you judging people. No, 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 I've never done that. You're going to live for where you're going to go. If you live for the devil, you're going to burn in hell. If you live for the king, you're going you're gonna to be with him. Whatever you're living for, that's where you end up at, y'all. That's not me judging you. That's you making stupid decisions. The word the woman of God came up with this morning, she said, choose you this day. Blessings or cursing, life or death, the choice is in your hands. Some people can't stand this heat I'm preaching this morning. Let me finish with this. Unbelief, Numbers 13, 20, it says, and the land, but the land, whether it, it be fat or lean, whether there be wood therein or not, uh, whether it be a good of good courage and bring the fruit of the land, now, the time was that the first ripe grapes, now he's telling his people, they, they didn't, he didn't ask them to go into the promised land. They asked if they could go and see if God was telling them the truth. They asked him, can we go and see? He said, go on in with your bad stuff. Go on in and look. So they went in there, and it was exactly what God told them. The big old grapes, everything was just like God told them. But when he asked them, well, what did you see? This is what they said. Watch this. That's what he says. And they told him and said, We came unto the land whither thou sendest us. And certainly it floweth with milk and honey. And this is the fruit of. 
Nevertheless, the people be strong that dwell in the land, and the cities are walled, and very great. And moreover, we saw the children of Anak, which means there were giants in the land. And the Amalekites dwell in the land of the south, and the Hittites and, and the Jebusites and the Amorites dwell in the mountains. And the Canaanites dwell by the sea and by the coast of Jordan. And Caleb stilled the people before Moses and said, let us go up at once and possess it, for we are well able to overcome it. But the men went up, that went up with them said, we be not able to go against the people, for they are stronger than we. And they brought up an evil report of the land that they had searched unto the children of Israel, saying, the land that we've gone to to search it, and the land that eateth up the inhabitants thereof, and all the people that we saw are, are men of great stature. Amen. Did you see that? And so they, they, they said that what they saw, everybody that they saw and everything they saw was greater than them. Was greater than them. Was greater than them. And, uh, and they saw, we saw giants in the son of Anak, which come to the giants, and they were in, our, and we were in their sights, grasshoppers, as we were in their sights. In our own sight, we were grasshoppers, as we were in there. In other words, they say the enemy saw us, and when they looked at us, we looked like grasshoppers to them. And what they said was, prophetically, grasshoppers don't have ears. They have five eyes. And so uh, they see more, but God says you can't walk by sight and get the promise. You got you to, gotta, you gotta, faith come by hearing. But see, I found out from further research that the ears of the, of the, of the, of the uh, grasshopper is on its belly. They have sensors on their belly that allow them to hear. The problem with that, the belly, when they walk, rubs against the earth. The only thing they can hear is what the earth is saying. They can't hear anything about what heaven is saying. So they were saying, we, we know you're God. We saw you split the Red Sea. We saw you bring us manna. We saw you bring us quail. We saw the water from the rock. We saw you split the Red Sea. We saw you uh, drown Pharaoh, but we can't hear you. We can't hear you. Because our ears are tuned to what the President Trump is saying. What the, con what the news is saying. Can't hear you because I'm too much on the Internet hearing what people who don't love you are saying. People on the Internet don't love you. They have expended no time in your life. Why are you listening to that? Can't hear you, Lord. My, my ears are bound to the earth. Can't hear you. So. What happened? The entire generation, except for three men, Caleb, Joseph, uh, Caleb, Joseph, and Joshua. Joseph's bones went over to the promised land. The other generations didn't make it. So why, how could three million, almost three million people not receive the promise of God? Because of doubt and unbelief. They, they, couldn't, they didn't get to enter into the promise. They spent, they spent more time to try to disprove the Bible than obey the Bible. One brother said, well, the Islam has one Bible, uh, the Quran. It never been changed. You idiot. What do you mean it hasn't been changed? You, every time they caught that man in immorality, they had to change what the Quran said. Every time they caught him lying and cheating and murdering, they had to change the Quran. Every time. It may not be a different name on it, but it's been edited and changed so many times. Come on, somebody. Now, I didn't call anybody an idiot unless you're one of the people I was talking about. If you don't fit in that category, then you're not an idiot. But if you do, I just have to put that bonnet on your head. It's going to be a big idiot right across the front of you. Because you're trying to disprove the life of a living God. 
You can't do it. They lost the whole generation, lost their lives. A hundred funerals a day for 40 years. A hundred funerals a day. That's why when they crossed the Jordan River to face, what was it? Jericho? The word Jericho means fragrance. That means that you've been having funerals every day for 40 years. Death, the smell of death is in the wilderness. So what I got to do, when you come into Christ, I'm going to change the fragrance that's in the air. It's, it, there's going to be a different smell in the air other than the death of your, uh, of, the, uh, of your generations of people who perished who could not believe. I have to stop. There's so much more I can share with you about this. What, was it, what, was, what were they? Mumbling, carnality, rebellion, and unbelief. Was this, he told Peter, Peter, Satan wishes to have you. Why, why is that significant? Because in the condition Peter was in, he was full of things that needed to be sifted out of him. And so Jesus said, he didn't say, well, I'm not going to let Peter get sifted. He's one of my, he says, well, okay, Peter, Satan has come. He wants to sift you, but I prayed. Not that you not get sifted, but after you're sifting, after you get sifted, that you be able to strengthen your brethren. Once you're converted, you're going to be able to strengthen. But he had to be, what? Sifted first, body. Body of Christ, I sense a sifting going on. And some of the conversation you have towards your children, your grandchildren, you have to change your speech. God's got, God's got to sift you. If you're going to affect the generation in a positive way, you have, a, you have to have a positive conversation. If you're going to affect anybody, you're going to have to have a positive conversation about the future. You just can't slide in with everybody. We used to have this beer club at FNC where I worked. And every Friday, we go to Pizza Jack's on Monterey Road, and we, we get big old mugs of beer and all the pizza we could eat. And we sit there and just have friendship over beer and pizza. We were friends. We were in one accord. Come on. We were all together. My boss was there, and he, would, he was the first one to pass out. And we just sit there, and then we say, we're friends. And we just be so happy. Oh, 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 oh. And then we go, Brr, and we just be so happy because we're just all getting, drinking that beer and eating that pizza. We put those peppers on the pizza and put that chili on there. And we eat that. And the stomach will go, Brr, and we just be happy as we could be. I mean, you know what I'm talking about. Amen. But now we're in the body of Christ. And we got a different kind of drink. They drank from the same rock. They drank from the same spirit. They had the same bread. They had the same covering over them. Everything was identical. They had the same word. They were saying, come on, you hear what I'm saying? How come we can do that in the world and we can't seem to get it together in the church? I didn't hear what you said. Give the Lord a phrase. Sifting, shaking, shifting, and now the Lord is sifting, looking for a refinement, looking to bring the final product to its fullest effect upon when you baking. I noticed my mother used to have a sifter, and she'd take the flour, and she'd pull that thing, and the powder would be so fine, there'd be a little mist of it in the air because she wanted those, that cake or those cookies, whatever she was baking, especially when she did those peach cobbler. Her favorite was uh, a lemon meringue pie and pineapple upside down cake. That was the thing that she would do. And she set that lemon meringue up on the little thing there. She said, don't touch it, boy. And I'd look at it. And I'd reach just a little bit. I just want to get a little bit of it. Boy! But there's something about that meringue on that lemon pie when it's piping hot. It's so good. By Christ, your father has prepared a table for you with something on it better than a lemon meringue pie, better than my mama's 
uh, her, her peach cobblers and all that and her sweet potato pies and all that. Uh, God has something for you, but it's only served at his table. Father, I praise you this morning that as you sift us, that we don't, that sifting doesn't make each other leave, that we don't leave, but Lord, that we would submit to the sifter, that we would submit to the process, that we would submit to that thing that you need to do in each one of our lives so that we can have the life that we all want a good life, but you can't have a good life doing good things. You have to have a life doing God things. And that's what brings the life and that life to you more abundantly. Father God, I pray that you would make this word so indelibly clear in our hearts today that no one be able to resist the intelligence of the Holy Spirit. There's so much more I could have said today, but I think I said enough for people to see that there's a sifting going on in the house of God. Have your way, I pray today. Come on, somebody say, in Jesus' name, do what you have to do, Father, to remove the mumbling from me, to remove carnality from me, do what you have to do to remove rebellion from me. And Lord, help my unbelief. In Jesus' name, somebody said amen and amen. I, I thought about the tears it must have caused Moses to know that those he had suffered for 40 years in the wilderness and an additional 40 years, that most of them were not going to get the promise. You know it must have broke his body of Christ. Let's go on together and not one of us not receive what God has promised us. Let's go all the way. You'll be better for it when you see what he's got for you. You'll be, ha you'll be, you'll be happy for it if you let him have his way. Father, I thank you. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Somebody said amen. Remember our conference on the 23rd uh, with Apostle McGee. On the 23rd, also he'll be here on the 24th and Sunday morning and Sunday night with Apostle Marshall McGee will be with us one more time. Amen. Somebody give the Lord a praise. Remember uh, Prophet Andrews going to the Philippines. His, his support letters are on the back table back there. Make sure you uh, support our brother as he goes once again to a kingdom conference uh, there in uh, They'll be in Mindanao. They'll be in uh, different places uh, in uh, uh, the Philippines. You know they're going to be uh, bringing the word of God concerning the kingdom. Amen? Praise God. Father, I ask that you release the people not from your presence, just from this place. It's in Jesus' name we pray and we all said.